Uh, okay, thanks, Bruce, and thanks, Craig. Uh, now that we've got a, a feeling for the tectonic domains in this area, we're going to take a look at a few of the time-dependent components of the structural framework and their metallogenic implications. Uh, so this is the new bedrock geology map of the Trek area that came out a couple of months ago. Uh, it was produced through a combination of aeromagnetic and gravity interpretation, a compilation of historic data and new boots on the ground mapping. Uh, through the production of this map, we, we got new insights into the structural and geological framework of the interior plateau. And in order to discuss those, can you guys hear me now? So in order to discuss those new uh, tectonic and uh, uh, structural interpretations in the context of the metallogenic framework. First thing we're going to do is uh, take a look at a few of the mineral deposits in the Trek area. Uh, as Craig mentioned, we're sitting sort of at the southern end of the Stikin terrain here. And elsewhere in the Stikin terrain, it's incredibly well endowed in late Triassic to middle Jurassic uh, mineralization. And that doesn't seem to be the case in the, the Trek area. The oldest known occurrences are these two uh, Middle Jurassic volcanic-hosted red bed copper deposits at the Lisa Gang and Pickle showings, which were both identified, uh, I should say, during mapping in 2015 rather than 2016. Uh, this sample comes from the Lisa Gang showing. We have native copper in an epidote vein. Uh, this assayed 2.81% copper and 7.05 grams per ton silver. Uh, probably the most significant implication of these two new showings is really the potential for discovery in this area. I mean, as Craig said, there's, there's very little outcrop here, but even the outcrops that do exist haven't been uh, exhaustively prospected yet. There are some late Jurassic and early Cretaceous intrusions, but I'm going to skip over to the, the late Cretaceous intrusions that are the focus of a lot of interest in this area. They include uh, porphyry, uh, copper molly in the case of Blackwater South and Key within the Trek area, and you can stretch that to copper molly gold if you include the huckleberry seal and ox uh, deposits which are just off the map to the northwest. Uh, the characteristic deposits of the late Cretaceous in the Trek area are these flow dome epithermal deposits, including Blackwater and Capoose. Uh, we're going to hear quite a bit more about those today, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but suffice it to say that our, our, they're not easily characterized using our current models. So we may need a new model to explain them, but they're, they're characteristically associated with rhyolite flow domes. Uh, in addition to Blackwater and Capoose, I would add Holy Cross to this classification. And here we just have an example of a brecciated flow banded rhyolite from the Holy Cross area. Uh, during the Eocene, we also have a sig significant number of deposits, and they're considerably more spread out. As Craig mentioned, this might just be the product of being the only area that we can... The, the late Cretaceous deposits being constrained to the area where we actually have late Cretaceous rocks exposed at the surface. Uh, but the Eocene deposits, again, have porphyry mineralization, particularly porphyry molly mineralization at the Chu prospect here, and uh, copper molly showings at the Aspen and Pa showings. Uh, the, the difference between the late Cretaceous and Eocene is that the Eocene epithermal occurrences tend to be real low sulfidation vein hosted uh, high grade epithermal deposits or occurrences. Uh, here we just have an example of a phreatic breccia from the trout prospect. Uh, so the, the question that I want to sort of focus on today is what's responsible for the distinction between these late Cretaceous and Eocene uh, mineralizing events. And uh, in order to do that, let's start out by just taking a look at the 
the late Cretaceous volcanic rocks that are associated with the, the late Cretaceous mineralization. So we've got the, the Kasalka group, which is essentially comprised of tracheandesite and high silica rhyolite. Uh, everything that we mapped in the field as an andesite or an andesitic tuff turned out to be absolutely chock full of uh, Cape Feldspar in the ground mass. Uh, the high silica rhyolites form these, these flow domes that have highly contorted flow bands, as you can see in the top right there. Uh, oh, they also form uh, volcanic clastic deposits where you have these vitric and crystal tufts uh, on the, the central bottom there. We have a, a fresh vitric tuff where it's got black obsidian fragments that are still glassy. And on the bottom right here, we have the same unit where it's been devitrified and these, these obsidian fragments are now white. Uh, if we take a look at the geochemistry of those, those volcanics, first off, we can see the, the moderately alkaline tracheandesite character of the intermediate samples here. And there's this gap in the acidic compositions. And then we have these high silica rhyolites uh, off on the right here. Uh, the, the rare earth element profiles for the tracheandesites have this, this characteristic listric shape. The, the flat mid to rare earth element composition uh, indicates hornblende was a fractionating phase at some point during its history. Uh, they also don't have a europium anomaly, which indicates that plagioclase was probably not a fractionating phase. Uh, those two characteristics suggest high pressure and high water content, which could be achieved at the base of a thickened crust section. Uh, in contrast, the, the high silica rhyolites do have a, a quite a strong europium anomaly, uh, but otherwise their rare earth element signatures look essentially the same. So that suggests that they underwent a second uh, generation of fractionation where plagioclase was a fractionating phase. Uh, the, the high silica rhyolites also are strongly paraluminous, uh, which suggests that, that uh, alkali feldspar was also a fractionating phase. And according to the work of Gualda and Giorso, just getting these high silica rhyolite compositions requires fractionation in the upper crust, like within the upper five kilometers of the crust. So it seems like the Kasalka group reflects a two-stage uh, fractionating system that fractionate, first fractionated at the base of a thickened crust and then fractionated again high in the crust. And both of those fractionating events uh, imply a component of compressional deformation. So if we take a look at the associated deformation, well, it is compressional. Uh, throughout the trek area, we see these northeast and southwest vergent uh, folds and thrusts. Uh, they're not incredibly well expressed in aeromagnetic data because they're generally shallow features, uh, but they are present, especially where we see sedimentary rocks. Uh, one of the best examples is in this figure in the top right here, which is actually at the turnoff to the Blackwater uh, deposit. Uh, you can see we have an overturned anticline in the hanging wall of this thrust fault here, and this one is southwest virgin, but for the most part, these structures are northeast virgin. Uh, they seem to have started in the early Cretaceous following deposition of the Bowser Lake group, uh, but they continued at least until the, this should say Campanian, not Cenomanian. So, so the deformation continued right up until the start of uh, er eruption of the Kasalka group. Uh, before we try and bring those together into a tectonic model. There's one uh, regional tectonic component that we need to consider, and that's the coast plutonic complex, which is the, the relic continental arc in uh, Western British Columbia. Uh, both of these figures come from a, a Gerald Zadal 2009 paper where they plotted out the distribution of geochron samples in the, the portion of the, the coast plutonic complex due west of the trek area. Uh, what I want to draw your attention to is these orange 
uh, late Cretaceous samples that are the same age as the Kasalka group, which essentially fall right along the coast shear zone here. Uh, we can see the same data plotted on this graph where along the x-axis we have the distance east of the coast shear zone and along the y-axis we have time. Uh, essentially what this shows is that since about 110 million years ago, the coast plutonic complex was a relatively well-behaved volcanic arc, which was not much more than 50 kilometers wide at any given time. And during the late Cretaceous to Eocene, that arc was at the location of the coast shear zone. Uh, the reason this is important is because the trek area and the late Cretaceous magmatism that we see there is 100 to 200 kilometers east of the arc axis. So it doesn't seem to be related to the arc itself. Uh, now let's see if we can put that into a tectonic model. Uh, in a typical arc system, we get, oh, how do I go back? In a typical arc system, we get dehydration of the slab, which causes hydration of the mantle wedge here. And as that mantle wedge gets brought down to about 100 kilometers depth, you get uh, dewatering of amphiboles, which cause partial melting, and you get a mash zone at the base of the crust, and eventually you get your arc magmatism in the upper crust. Uh, our model for what's going on in the, the trek area during the late Cretaceous is that we, we see all this evidence for crustal thickening, which would have essentially depressed the, the former mash zone at the base of the, the Stikine terrain down far enough that it, it underwent a low degree partial melting. And because it's melting a, a former mash zone, it's essentially producing a magma that looks like an arc magma. Uh, it might be slightly more alkaline because we have this low degree of partial melting, but the characteristics are mostly the same and it has the ability to produce the same style of deposits. Uh, once that magma reaches the upper crust, we still have compression which stops it from erupting as, uh, as extrusive volcanics for the most part, and we get this upper crustal fractionation to high silica rhyolites, and we get our associated uh, rhyolite dome deposits. Uh, if some of the material that melts is uh, evolved crustal material, then we can end up with uh, within plate granites forming. And we actually do see that elsewhere in BC, for example, in the late Cretaceous Bayon Suite and in the, the late Cretaceous Bayon Suite, which is in Southeast BC near Kootenai Lake and the Surprise Lake Batholith in Northwest BC. Now let's see if we can do the same thing for the Eocene. Uh, the Eocene volcanic rocks are the Utsa Lake group and the Indaco group. The Utsa Lake group is dominantly rhyolitic, but it does extend into andesite and tracheandesitic compositions. The, the felsic components, again, are, are commonly flow banded where they're competent, but they don't tend to form flow domes, they form extrusive flows. Uh, the, the flow banding in them is typical, typically planar, like in this figure on the bottom left here. Uh, and overlying the, the Utsa Lake group, we have the Indaco group, which is basalt to tracheandesite, and uh, also forms laterally extensive flows. Uh, here we have an example at the Kenny Dam, where we have this competent flow, and right at the top we have a, a vesicular flow top separating from the next flow. Uh, one of the characteristics of the Indaco group is that it's exceptionally high in titanium, which you can see in this thin section here, which is full of rutile phenocrysts. Now, if we look at the geochemistry, again, it's moderately alkaline, but we don't see a gap in dacitic compositions, and we also don't see any strongly paraluminous components. So it suggests that the Utz Lake group didn't undergo this extensive upper crustal fractionation. Uh, if we first just look at the early Eocene uh, rare earth element plots, again, well, it doesn't show up very well, but we, we have this listric shape. Uh, I've plotted in here as well the Utz Lake group, or the, the Quantia suite, which is the intrusive equivalent of the Utz Lake group. And uh, the one distinction is that it, 
some of these samples have a, a higher fractionation of heavy rare earth elements as opposed to mid rare earth elements, which is an indication of garnet stable fractionation. Now, the late Eocene samples uh, look completely different. Uh, they have, a, a, again, this high titanium content, which is suggestive of an E more basalt composition. Uh, they have generally flat, but only slightly uh, negative sloping uh, rare earth element profiles, which are also consistent with an e morb composition uh, with only a minor amount of fractionation. Uh, if we plot all of the samples that we have on this basalt discrimination, basalt discrimination diagram from Pierce, you can see that the e morb samples, which are these actually hollow green samples in here, follow a trend line between a, a primary EMORB composition and a continental art material. Oops. Uh, the Utsa Lake group is, is character, characteristically associated with this north-south uh, magnetic striping. Uh, Esther Bourdais established that this magnetic striping pattern actually corresponds to uh, north-south normal faults, and these are associated with northwest trending dextral faults, which are a, a major component of the, the regional uh, Lake Cretaceous deformation system. Uh, overall, this corresponds to east-west extension in the early, early Eocene, and there's a transition in the late Eocene where the Indaco group is associated with northeast, southwest trending normal faults. Uh, one of the best examples of this is right near the Kenny Dam, where we have this Natalka's normal fault, northwest side down, which is bounding a high mag domain of Indaco group basalt. Uh, these uh, southwest trending normal faults are associated with north trending dextral faults. Uh, you can see a couple of them here in the far northwest corner of the Trek map area. And overall, this corresponds to northwest-southeast extension. So during the Eocene, we have a transition from east-west extension to northwest-southeast extension. Uh, again, we've got to take into account the coast plutonic complex before we can turn this into a tectonic model. Uh, we're still sitting one to 200 kilometers east of the coast plutonic complex, but during the Eocene, there was a huge magmatic flux within the plutonic complex. Uh, this diagram on the top right here shows the, the magmatic flux of this black line, which is relatively low flux during the late Cretaceous and just skyrockets during the Eocene before shutting off completely. Uh, the, the, the main interpretation for why this happened is the creation and uh, final consumption of the resurrection plate. So the idea is that around 60 million years ago, we had the, the creation of this mid-ocean ridge, which, caused, which created the resurrection plate, which ra rapidly subducted towards the east. And once the mid-ocean ridge hit the subduction zone on the western side of North America, we had a transition to uh, a transform boundary. So that marks our transition from east-west extension to northwest-southeast extension. Uh, now, if we want to consider a tectonic model, again, we can't use the, the uh, normal arc model because we're too far east. We can't use the crustal thickening model because we're in a period of widespread extension. Uh, one other way to get magmatism this far inboard of the arc would be this uh, secondary arc model, which was proposed by Tatsumi, where uh, the same uh, subduction dewaters and, and generates a, a hydrous uh, mantle wedge, which the amphibole breaks down at 100 kilometers, but the, the phlogopite in that mantle wedge won't break down until it reaches 200 kilometers. Uh, one of the implications of that is that it'll break down in the garnet stability field, so that could be generating the garnet signature that we see in some of these Eocene samples. Uh, the, the magma produced would then undergo, undergo normal mass processes and end up in the upper crust with the ability to form uh, arc-like deposits once again. 
the potential reason that we're seeing this secondary arc during the Eocene is because we have this exceptionally high rate of subduction that's causing the major magmatic flux in the Coast Plutonic complex, which could also drag this mantle wedge down to 200 kilometers to, to release water from phlogophyte. Uh, during the late Eocene, we, we have shut off of the, the arc system. We, the, the subducting slab is now way down here. Uh, we have this transform plate boundary uh, at the western margin of North America and underneath the entire arc and uh, intermontane terrains, we would have had uh, upwelling of what used to be mid-ocean ridge uh, mantle, more mantle, uh, which then would interact with the material in the asthenosphere below uh, Western North America and uh, would have been enriched. So we get this EMORB composition and if we get a low degree of partial melting in that with very little interaction in the mash zone, then we could get these EMORB basalts that we see as the Indaco group at the surface. Uh, the metallogenic implication of that is that this melting is occurring without any material being derived from the subducting slab. So we don't have a significant component of sulfur, which when, we, when combined with the lack of a significant uh, lower crustal fractionation event, means that any metal that, that ends up in the melt here ends up in the volcanics at the surface. So these could be potentially a, a very rich source to generate uh, low sulfidation epithermal mineralization. So in conclusion, in addition to generating a new geological map, the Trek mapping project has provided insight into the metallogenic events in the Trek area, particularly that these late Cretaceous flow dome epithermal deposits are a product of upper crustal fractionation during compression, and the Eocene low sulfidation epithermal deposits are a product of arc termination and occur during extension and transtension. And uh, I hope I've convinced some of you that you'll want to read the report to go along with the map that's coming out in, uh, uh, well, as soon as I can get it finished. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>